think when I've been singing it in my head, I've been singing it a bit lower. <laughs> Let's pray as we come to God's Word. Father God, thank you uh, for the gift of your Word, the Bible. Father, help us this morning uh, to understand it, help us to apply it to our lives, and help us uh, to mean that we live better for you because of it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, a few years ago, I had a very serious operation. Now, I know many of you have heard about my heart. Uh, that was uh, a couple of years ago. This one's a few years before, and it was a bit lower down. Uh, I was about 25 years old, and I woke up with a pain in a rather personal place. Uh, but I woke up uh, and just thought, oh, I'll just have slept funny. It'll be absolutely fine, you know, there'll be no problems. Uh, and I wrote it off as just being, you know, I was just one of those things. But as the day went on, the pain didn't go away. And I told a friend who I was working with at the time, they were like, you really should go to the doctor. You really need to go to a &E. You need to go now. And I said, oh, no, it's nothing. It's really not a problem. I'll be absolutely fine. And they nagged me, and they nagged me, and they nagged me. And in the end, they walked me to a &E. uh, This was while I lived in Lancaster. And we got to a &E. About 10 minutes after having got there, a fire alarm went off. And we were all evacuated outside. And we had about, uh, they said, oh, it's going to be about an hour before you get in. And I was thinking, oh, this is a waste of time. I'm just going to go home. It's probably nothing. It's fine. But again, my friend just said, no, look, I'll stand with you. I'll wait with you. And sure enough, about an hour later, we could get back in. I was still convinced there was really nothing wrong with me. I thought I was making a mountain out of a molehill. But eventually, after being seen about an hour and a half later, I was rushed into surgery. And I reckon it was about 20 minutes between being seen and being under general anaesthetic. It was that quick. And they told me that if I'd just been about an hour or maybe two hours later, then there's a chance that I wouldn't have been able to have any children. It was that serious what was wrong. See, I was convinced that I wasn't ill, but actually I was seriously ill. I was convinced that there was nothing really serious. It was nothing. But actually I was in real danger. Now, I wish I could say that's the last time that happened in that story, but when I did have a heart issue, I had exactly the same thing over again, and Caroline had to tag me uh, to go to the doctor's. But you see, some people have hypochondria, don't they? They think they're ill when they're not. But I think I sort of have the opposite. I've sort of got an anti-hypochondria. You know, I'm actually ill when I don't think that I am. I wonder if some of you have the same problem that I do. Well, there are certainly some people in the passage this morning that have the same kind of issue. But not with physical illness, but with spiritual illness. That's what they're in denial about. Jesus comes as doctor, but they're convinced that they're basically okay. I imagine that all of us have got sort of similar stories to tell at some point of a time we thought that we were okay and we really weren't. But Jesus is here to show us uh, that actually something really serious is wrong with us. Well, let's see what Jesus has to say. So our first point, Jesus welcomes sinful people. Let me read to you again verses 13 uh, to 15. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. So in our story, Jesus has been travelling around, while well, here he returns to the sea of Galilee. And he returns to doing what he'd been doing in chapter 1, preaching and teaching. And that's the thing, if you remember, in chapter 1, people were trying to stop him from doing that. They were trying to deflect him from the mission. The pressure had been for Jesus to stop teaching, to stop preaching, and just heal people. But Jesus had explained in chapter 1 that that's what he'd come for. He'd come to teach and to preach. And now he goes about teaching. And as he's teaching, he comes across a tax collector. Now, I didn't know my father-in-law was going to be here this morning, who used to work for the Inland Revenue. He is normally uh, my source of illustration. Thankfully, I haven't got any illustrations that mention you, Jim, uh, this morning. But in general, apart from my father-in-law, nobody likes a tax collector, do they? But especially in this country, where Jesus lived. In his country, they were occupied by the Romans. And that meant that their taxes actually went to fund the people who were oppressing them. When they gave their money for taxes, actually it paid for the very people who were keeping them under occupation. 
It's like they were oppressed and basically paying for the privilege. And tax collectors were the middleman. They took their funds from the countrymen that were around them and they gave them to the enemy, they gave them to the Romans. And the way that they made a living was that they took a cut of it for themselves. And it was a lucrative position. People wanted to be tax collectors. If they wanted to get rich, that was one of the ways that you would do it. And it meant that it was very open to abuse as well. Tax collectors often took more than was required and they kept the rest for themselves. It's not an exaggeration to say that they were despised by their countrymen. They were despised, but they were rich. And for them, that was a big enough payoff. They were happy to be despised if it meant that they could get rich. They sold out their own people for a materially comfortable life. And Jesus here stops at a tax booth, not to pay his taxes, though Jesus did. He stops to make a new disciple. That's what he's doing. A disciple called Levi. Now, Matthew's gospel calls him Matthew. I guess he gets to pick because it's his gospel. Maybe he prefer the name Matthew like I prefer the name Chris to Christopher. But in fact, even Mark calls him Matthew later on in the gospel, and does Luke. So we've got to ask the question, why does Matthew call him, oh, sorry, why does Mark call him Levi here? He knows his name is Matthew. Well, some people had more than one name in those days, so Simon Peter, Bartholomew Nathaniel, Judas Thaddeus, Saul Paul. And so here Matthew's other name was Levi. But he calls him Levi here, probably to, to draw attention to what his family was. Levi would have been a family name. It reminds us what tribe he's from. He's from the tribe of the Levites. Matthew Levi should almost certainly have been a priest, really, if he was following what he should have done. But instead of collecting tithes for the temple, here he is collecting taxes for the Romans. Matthew Levi is a sign just how far the nation has fallen. A traitor to his people, and from the tribe of priests, no less. It's a reminder that the old ways of the Jews, even if you were a priest, couldn't make you righteous. Look at what had become of this guy. Jesus will talk more about this in the next part, in Mark. But you see, whilst the nation was making a show of righteousness, it's a reminder here that the old is on the way out. The old couldn't do anything. New wine needs new wine skins. And Levi is a reminder of that. But he sat here on the customs station on the road, charging duties and customs on travelling salesmen. And Jesus calls him. And just as he did with the gruff fisherman in chapter 1, the call is simple. Follow me. That's what Jesus says, follow me. And just as the fisherman left and followed Jesus, so Matthew Levi rises up, leaves his tax booth, and follows Jesus. And it's no coincidence that Mark has Matthew Levi stand up to follow Jesus. In the very last passage, Jesus has performed a miracle, forgiving a man's sin, and then healing his legs. And Jesus' command to him is to get up to follow him. Jesus performs a miracle so that the man could stand up. And here in the very next verses, Jesus performs another miracle as another man stands up. It's a miracle because a camel goes through the eye of a needle. A rich man enters the kingdom of heaven. He rises like the formerly paralyzed person and takes his first steps following the Lord Jesus. But it's strange what Jesus does here, isn't it? It's strange that he's calling this guy in the first place. I mean, this is a Roman collaborating tax collector. Who wants one of them as a disciple? A man his own people would view as scum, and who the Romans now wouldn't trust because he's a turncoat, he's turned his back on them. And Matthew Levi has taken the even stranger step, if Jesus calling him was weird, Matthew Levi has taken the strange step of actually doing what Jesus says. He gets up and he follows him. And I think the world in general will think this is weird on both sides, wouldn't they? That a holy Jesus would want a blatant sinner as a follower, and that a blatant sinner would stand up and follow Jesus. But in one sense, isn't that all our stories, if we're trusting in Jesus this morning? I often wonder why Jesus would choose me. I really do. When I look at myself and what I'm like, 
And it's the theme of many old hymns, isn't it? And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Died he for me, who caused his pain, for me, who him to death pursued? Or I stand amazed, amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Theme of many old songs, isn't it? But it's true. He does. Jesus chooses sinful, sinful people to be his followers. And sinners choose him. Think back through history, notorious people down through the ages. People like slave trader John Newton. People like gang leader Nicky Cruz. People like perjurer Jonathan Aitken. The press and the media often get quite cynical about these things, don't they, when people turn to Jesus. And yet Dr. Jesus undeniably turns their life around. And here Jesus welcomes this traitor, a sinner, Matthew Levi. They sit down together, you know, and eat together. So it's not just that he's like his doctor, actually he comes and eats with him. It's a sign of fellowship, of friendship. You don't eat with your enemies. And it's not just Matthew Levi, there's a whole bunch of people here who have started to follow Jesus. Tax collectors and notorious sinners. Now it's unclear whether it's Matthew Levi's house or Jesus' house. We know from chapter 1 that Jesus has some sort of base in the area. But whoever it is, they're eating together. They're reclining together. And Jesus is hosting this meal for tax collectors and sinners. They're eating at Jesus' table. Jesus is a friend to these people. Jesus welcomes these scummy outcasts, as the world would see them, to feast with him at his table. And that should make us stop and think, shouldn't it, in our own lives? Who would you have to your table? You ever played that game? You know, where someone says, you know, if you have five people from history, who would you have around your table? And you know, it's Albert Einstein, yeah. Joan of Arc, Leonardo da Vinci, Barry White, depends what you really go for. <laughs> But who does Jesus choose? He picks his period in history to come. He picks his place to be. And who does he have around his table? Not the religious elites, but the outcasts. The people that other people would write off. And indeed, those other people have written them off. The scribes and the Pharisees can't believe their eyes, can they? Here is one such a great teacher that they've heard about, a healer who is crowd swamping him. And who is he eating with? low lives and scumbags in their mind. And they're not happy. And you can sort of understand what they're getting at, can't you? I mean, how would you respond if you heard that a prominent Christian leader had a drug dealer coming round that house every night? How would you think if uh, it turned up one of the Archbishops, Bishop of Canterbury's close friends, who had been on family holidays or something, was a prostitute or an escort? People would be calling for his resignation, wouldn't they? So what is Jesus doing? Well, Jesus has an answer, doesn't he? He's not doing shady dealings. He's not being underhand. He's on a mission. Why is he hanging around with these people? Why is he calling them to be his disciples? Well, that's our second point. Because it's the sick that need a doctor. Have a look with me again at verses 16 and 17. I'll read them to you. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus uses a proverb here. Now the saying is not original to Jesus. It's a proverb that dates back to a Spartan king back in the 5th century BC uh, called Pausanias. Mm -hmm. I, I assume that's how you pronounce it. Um, and uh, he was telling this because he was asked why he spent so much time in their sort of rival city. And he said, you know, it's not the, uh, it's the custom of doctors not to spend time with the healthy, but with the sick. That was his explanation of why he'd been uh, so often in their rival city. Now, interestingly, that king hated doctors. Uh, he said that they should try, try and attack Greece by sending them doctors rather than generals. And when they tried to uh, help him, uh, the doctors, he sent them away, insisting that he was well and telling them that they should spend their time with people who were actually sick. Just makes you wonder how he died, doesn't it? History doesn't record what happened. 
But whether, humanly speaking, Jesus had heard of this saying, it applies so well to the situation, doesn't it? Jesus is hanging with these people because they're sick and he's the doctor. They're happy to have the great physician come and treat them because they know that morally they're sick. They don't need to take a spiritual LFT or a moral PCR. They know that they're messed up. That red line on their thing would show up like a Belisha beacon, wouldn't it? And they're drawn to Jesus because he offers them what the world doesn't. He offers them acceptance and hope and forgiveness. He welcomes them to his table. He doesn't write them off. And he has the power to offer them forgiveness which we saw in the passage just before. Acceptance, hope and forgiveness is something they could never hope for in the world around them. They are sick people and they know that they need a doctor and so they're drawn to him. And he is drawn to them because of his heart of compassion. He knows that they're sick. He knows that they need help. But all the world offers them is condemnation and judgment. All the world offers them is rejection, isn't it? In the world, they're consigned to the rubbish tip, the fringes. Nobody wants to eat with tax collectors and sinners. But in Jesus' kingdom, they're welcome at his table. They're welcome at his surgery. Has it ever struck you before how Christianity, the gospel, Jesus, is there for people who have failed morally and who still fail morally, not for the perfect people, but for the people who fail. The gospel, as you read it through, is for losers, the weak, the poor, the humbled. And yet so often as Christians, so often as churches, we try to make ourselves look strong, don't we? We try to act strong and, uh, and, and rich and impressive, if you like. I'm glad that church is no longer a fashion parade. Uh, I think it was probably before my time, but you know, it was a time when people would turn to church and, Sort of all their, their finest clothes and everything like that. I'm glad that it's not like that anymore. But we can do that with our behaviour, can't we? As much as we can with our clothes. Putting on our airs and graces. I mean, would you know that the person sat in front of you or behind you is a sinner this morning? I don't say the person next to you, because you probably know them quite well. <laughs> what about the person in front or behind? Do you know that they're a sinner? I bet you do in your heads, don't you? You know theologically, yeah, the Bible says that they're a sinner. But why don't we actually see that? Why don't we see that on a Sunday morning? Why are we shocked when we do see that? It actually turns out that people that we've known for years, who we know are sinners theologically, when they actually sin, we're shocked. Strange, isn't it? The mask starts to slip occasionally. But as Paul Washer in the States put it memorably at the start of the epidemic, people at his church were complaining about wearing masks. He said, some of you are mad about wearing a mask to church, but you've been doing it for years. That was his comment on it. And it's not a denial that we're ill. We'll come to that in a minute. It's far more sinister, really, what we do as Christians. It's pretending that we're ill when we know we are. Sorry, pretending that we're not ill when we know that we are. We're not denying that we're sick, but we pretend that we're well. <clears throat> Church is really a hospital for sinners, isn't it? Not a hotel for saints. You know that's how it should be. We've heard that before, probably. It's where we come and meet with our doctor because we acknowledge that we are sick. We come and meet with the Lord Jesus. Except so often we don't do it. We just act well. Any symptoms? No, I'm fine, fine. No, no, no struggles at all. That's what we make out, isn't it? We believe that everyone is a sinner, yeah? Has fallen short of the glory of God, yeah? And yet if someone shows obvious symptoms of that, we think there's something wrong. Isn't that strange? In Corinth, in the Bible, people got drunk at church. So when they shared communion, they had much, uh, ours is non-alcoholic wine, so there's no danger of that, don't worry. But they drink so much that they get drunk. Could you imagine that? What would we do if someone turned up half drunk at the door on a Sunday morning with a bottle of whiskey in their hand? Would we turn them away? Would we tell them that they've come to the wrong place? This is a respectable place, the house of God. Or would we welcome them in? What if someone turned up on a Sunday morning dressed like a prostitute? 
what would we do? Would we tell them to get dressed? Would we insist that they wear a long coat to cover themselves up? Would we think that we're better than that? We say that church is a hospital for sinners. We preach that the gospel is for everyone. But I know that most of us would have a knee-jerk reaction to those things, wouldn't we? But that puts us firmly in our passage in, with the Pharisees, doesn't it? That's where we are here. And it puts us against Jesus and what he preached and how he lived. Now, we are not Jesus. We're not sinless. We do have to be careful not to fall into the sins of others. But in our efforts to be pure, have we lost our passion for mercy? Have we lost sight of what we once were and what we are deep down? Do we look at the modern day equivalents of tax collectors and sinners and see it as an excuse to condemn them? Or do we see it as an opportunity to show mercy and compassion as the likes that Jesus showed? So often we act like Pharisees when we should be acting like Jesus. So really our passage just leaves us with two options and this is our last point. Two options, fault find or follow. Let me read to you again verse 16. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with sinners? and tax collectors. You see what the Pharisees are doing here? They think they're fine. They have some weird form of that anti-hypochondria that we were talking about at the beginning. They can see that other people are sick, but they don't think that they're sick themselves. They see themselves as morally superior to the tax collectors and sinners, as better than them. But a small dose of the Black Death will kill you just as surely as a big dose. One may have more obvious symptoms than the other, but they both have the same disease. A disease that is fatal in 100% of cases. No one is entirely asymptomatic. But could you imagine someone boasting, saying, well, I've got fewer symptoms than you, I've got the same disease, I've got the black death, but at least I'm, you know, not got a runny nose. And yet that's what we do, isn't it? When you ask someone what they're like, you know what people say, oh, I'm not perfect. But if you think about it, what that does mean is that we are ill. If you're not well, then you are sick. But there are people here who don't get it. I didn't get it at first, I remember not getting it. And it was actually somebody preaching this very passage, or at least the one from Luke's Gospel, that woke me up to the fact that I needed a doctor. I thought Christianity before that was about trying harder. It was about self-improvement. I thought I was a Christian, but actually I felt like a horrible failure. How could God accept me when I was so bad at following his rules? Because I thought that's what it was all about. But when I heard this passage explained, everything started to fall into place. We're not basically okay in need of self-improvement. We're sick in need of a doctor. And Jesus is that doctor. And he heals sinners in the same way that he heals the sick. He doesn't sort of prescribe a self-help program, you know, do this and you'll be fine. He performs a miracle. You see, nowhere in the Gospels does Jesus do the normal doctor thing, does he? You know, prescribe a bit of bed rest and hot towels and whatever. He heals instantly and he heals completely. And he forgives instantly and he forgives completely. And Matthew Levi gets it now. When the doctor comes, when the doctor calls, he comes. He leaves everything and follows him. I bet you his friends would have said about Matthew, you know, become a follower of Jesus, Matthew. That would take a miracle. But that's exactly what happens, isn't it? That's exactly what Jesus does. As the paralysed man rises at the word of Jesus, so Matthew Levi rises and follows Jesus at a mere word. So you can either fault find in other people, or you can follow but if you're to follow, you must recognise, like Matthew Levi, that you're sick and that you need a doctor. But if you do come to the doctor, he will heal you. More than that, he'll welcome you to his table. He'll welcome you to eat with him. In Luke's Gospel, the Pharisees call Jesus a friend of sinners. And they mean it as an insult. And actually, for us, it's a precious name, isn't it? Jesus welcomes sinners and eats with them. There is guests, there is friends. 
Now, it might be that you're here this morning and you've never come to the doctor. You've never realised that you were sick. Or you suspected that you were, but you've never admitted it before. Listen to my friend from all those years ago who badgered me. Go to the doctor. <laughs> Tell him that you're sick. Ask him to heal you. In other words, come to Jesus, pray to him, admit that you're a sinner, and ask him to forgive you. Because he welcomes sinners and eats with them. But he's no friend here of people who pretend that they're well, who just spend their time fault-finding in others to make themselves feel better. And for those of us who have come to the doctor this morning, who have been forgiven by Jesus, we need to remember our amazingly privileged position. We've come from sick outcasts to welcomed friends. We've gone from lepers to loved ones. Tax collectors to table guests is what we are. Are you enjoying that fellowship with Jesus? Are you recognising that your sin and sickness is no longer enough to separate you from the doctor? You've not come to a hack or a quack, but to, some great, but to a great physician. He is able to deal with your sickness. He's able to deal with your sin. So you can come to him. He can heal you. And unlike most doctors I know, he doesn't mind if you bother him with your symptoms. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes I meet doctors, and if you sort of <clears throat> mention, you know, they say, oh, I'm a doctor, and I say, well, I've got this little mark on my leg. <laughs> and they don't like that, do they? <laughs> but Jesus doesn't mind. We can go to him, <coughs> keep coming to him with our symptoms for help. He wants us to admit our sin and come to him for aid and cleansing in our time of need. So we need to keep coming to him as our doctor. But we also need to enjoy fellowship with him. We're not to just self-quarantine away from him, if you like. He invites us to share with him, not just our symptoms, but our lives, to dine with him. Revelation 3.20 is quite a famous verse, but it's often quoted as though it's not to believers. It's to believers. Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, and opens the door. I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. This year, why not make it your goal to spend more decent time with Jesus? He's forgiven us for fellowship. He wants us to enjoy our time with him, to enjoy spending time with him in word and prayer. The doctor welcomes us to his table. So don't stay away from the doctor. Whatever your condition, whatever I did, uh, like I did. The results can be far more devastating than even they could have been in my case. Jesus tells us to fear more what can destroy the soul than what can destroy the body. So when you see a doctor or medical expert on the TV uh, in the next day, week, month, I guarantee you that you will, let it draw your mind to the great physician Jesus. You can deal with the baddest sickness in the world, which is sin. Don't be an anti-hypochondriac like I was. You have a big problem, like Matthew Levi did. But you have a big doctor who can deal with it. So let's go to him and trust in him to deal with our problem. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus is a doctor. Father, we thank you that despite the fact that we are sick, Father, despite the fact that we have not even met our own standards, let alone yours, Father, thank you that the Lord Jesus can forgive us. Father, thank you that he can welcome us to his table. And Father, pray that we take advantage of that this year. Just in Jesus' name. Amen.